So uh, Manos asked us to talk about no something is an island, so no science is an island. What do I mean by that? Um, <coughs> well, yeah, TEDx, TED, TEDx talks are generally pretty positive about science, and I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to ask you to be um, skeptical about science. Um, when we say no science is an island, well, science can't exist in isolation from people. The scientists themselves are people. Uh, some of the science we do, yeah, isn't about people. When we're looking up at the galaxies, when we're looking at our particle accelerators, all of that would be true whether or not people were around to observe it. But people and society decided that that science was worth doing and, and put the money in. And yeah, the people doing the science are part of society too. Um, and science is relevant, even these big, even these big uh, astronomy and, and relativity and quantum mechanics uh, are, are all important. Quantum mechanics is what's bringing you the sound right now through all these transistors. And uh, if you didn't think relativity was very much use to you, when you drive down the street, the uh, satellites that are sending you the GPS signal that are telling you when to turn are using general and special relativity to correct in opposite directions the signal that's coming in. So I'm not here to question science. Here is a wonderful piece of science going overhead and we're all very happy that it works. So the science I, I want to talk about here today is psychology. Psychology is my field now. I don't know exactly what uh, Manos told you. I've come to psychology pretty late in life. I'm still a bit of an outsider. Um, but I may use the word we, meaning psychologists. And if there are any psychologists here, I apologize for including myself in that number. I'm not really a proper psychologist. Um, Like most sciences, psychology started off as a branch of philosophy. Um, many of the great philosophers of antiquity were also the leading scientists of their day. Um, this is Baruch Spinoza. He wrote a lot of psychological stuff in his writings. Um, this is Friedrich Nietzsche. And if you've read any Nietzsche, there's an awful lot of psychology in there. But in the second half of the 19th century, psychology after physics and chemistry and the natural sciences kind of split away from philosophy, it got its own journals, it started doing scientific things like making hypotheses, making observations, performing experiments, making deductive inferences. But although psychology has been using those methods for over a century now, really it doesn't have very much to show for it. Um, psychology has not become what we call a cumulative science. We don't have to derive relativity from first principles every time we get a new bunch of physics undergraduates in. We just teach them, and it's true. This is a, a, a nice little article I read recently that illustrates this frustration. Where is psychology's non-stick frying pan? There, there is a belief, at least I think in the English-speaking world, that we didn't have the fry, non-stick frying pan until we had the space program. Uh, that actually isn't true. Teflon was invented before the Second World War, but when you hold a non-stick frying pan in your hand, our model is somehow that you got that from the astronauts. Um, now, uh, we're not producing that kind of technology from psychology. Uh, as the author says, you know, whenever we've tried to apply uh, psychology uh, in, in large numbers, we quite often get it wrong. We've had cognitive behavioral therapy, but we also have recovered memory therapy that resulted in a lot of innocent people going to jail. So why is this? Well, you can't turn a science into a technology until the science is solid uh, and repeatable. Uh, you can't have an industrial revolution until you can make parts. You have to be able to really forget about the science. The science has to just sit there in a corner and work. Um, 
Same for the electronics revolution. Um, the people at Intel who design processors, very few of them have to worry about how a transistor works. It's just a couple of lines on a diagram for them. And the biggest problem for psychology is that, yeah, human beings are individual and unique, and that is what makes us uh, human beings. Try to imagine what it would be like if we weren't all unique. Imagine that there are hundreds of copies of you personally. What's, what makes you special when there's 100, 200, 1,000 of you? So psychologists have a problem. Um, they don't want too many other differences between the people in their research because that confuses whatever their search is for whatever little thing they're looking for today. So at some level, without ha them having to be evil, the success of psychologists depends on denying an amount of your individuality. So they say things like, we split our participants into equal size groups matched by age and sex. So here is an example of two equal size groups of people matched by age and sex. Um, I don't think that's necessarily what they were trying to achieve. What happens in practice is recruiting people for psychological studies is expensive and time consuming. So we tend to use just people who are readily available. So the overwhelming majority of people who take part in psychological studies are Westerners. 96% I mean, of people in studies are Westerners, only 12% of the population. 68% of all the people in psychological studies are American. Of those 68%, 77% are white. 67% of them are studying psychology. If you're majoring in psychology at an American university, you are 4,000 times more likely to be taking part in psychological research than anybody else. And so the first problem is we don't have the right people. The second is we're not really getting people to do what we think they're doing. Um, these days, you can't just give people electric shocks and you can't dress them up as prison guards and tell them to be horrible to other participants. So psychologists spend a lot of time designing substitutes for these behaviors and then trying to justify how they're close to the real thing. So for example, if you're researching into positive and negative emotions and how they might differently affect people, what you tend to do is you show them a video. You'll show some people a comedy video and you'll show some people a video about someone with cancer. And maybe if you want some people to be in a neutral mood, you'll show them a nature documentary or something. And they watch that for 10 minutes and you say, we have induced a positive or negative mood in these people. But these are, especially if they're undergraduates, these are people who've been watching four hours of television every day uh, since they were born. And you might wonder just how much of a difference 10 minutes of TV viewing is going to make. They're pretty much used to just switching off the TV and getting on with their lives where the real happy or sad things happen. And to make it even worse, when we want to find out how people are feeling, we just ask them. We can't do a lot better than that because we still don't have a machine to look inside your head, whatever you see in the papers of pictures of brains that are lighting up. We can't tell how you're feeling. Um, so we ask them questions, and sometimes we ask them lots and lots of questions. And we pretend that all of their answers from question one to question 80 have all been considered with the same amount of care I don't know if you've ever filled in one of those forms that the hotel sends you after a stay and they ask you to rate the cleanliness of the public areas on a scale of one to seven. You're clicking through that to get to the end. Um, so, and again, most of these people are studying psychology. They want to learn how the experiment works. They're not just sitting there being subjects. They're trying to help you, although occasionally they're trying to hinder you. There are lots of reasons why your study might not be a perfect reflection of uh, reality, but people love to tell stories. The academic journals love to hear them. 
The popular media love to put these stories in. This is the believed to be the ultimate headline in the English language, man bites dog. Um, when your study appears in the newspaper, it doesn't say psychology undergraduates at the university of wherever were 4% more likely to say that they preferred chocolate to sex after they watched a video of polar bears. It's going to say official scientists show that people prefer chocolate to sex. Um, and this is not just tabloids and lifestyle magazines. Uh, the university press departments are happy to send these stories to very reputable news outlets. Um, here's a report showing that if you cut a centimeter off one of your chair legs and you're sitting there wobbling, uh, you are apparently going to perceive your romantic relationships are less stable than if you are sitting on a normal chair. Um, or here's a nice one. People, some people sat inside a giant cardboard cube in the laboratory and some other people sat next to the giant cardboard cube and they were asked to come up with creative ideas. And the ones who were sitting inside the cube had fewer creative ideas because the other people were thinking outside the box. Um, or lonely people take hotter baths and shower to compensate for the lack of warmth in their life. Um, now, these studies are almost certainly wrong. They don't tell us how people really behave. They tell us about how some kind of pretend people behaved or said that they thought that they felt uh, in a laboratory. But you can buy a whole bunch of books full of gee whiz stories like this. Almost all of them very, posi very possibly not true. Last week, a story came out, you may have seen it in the newspaper, that a group of researchers took 100 studies in psychology and tried to get the same results as the original researchers. And in six, over 60% of the cases, they didn't, they failed. They weren't so much man bites dog as man bites hot dog. And psychologists are running around at the moment trying to explain why this happened. But I'm interested actually in the ones that did, they did manage to replicate because we still don't know if they mean anything useful. All we know is that under the same conditions, which is to say in a laboratory full of psychology students, people did mostly the same things. We still don't know what that tells us about real life. So what can you do when you come across these kind of claims? You can start by asking yourself if it even sounds remotely plausible. Um, if it does, then maybe it's true, but it's also possible the researchers haven't discovered anything very special at all. Here is a very distinguished gentleman, a Norwegian psychologist called Jan Smedsland. He argues that a lot of things psychologists say are true simply because of what the words mean. And then if the study seems to show they're right, they haven't shown anything. For example, if a study tells you that people try to do or to get things that will increase their happiness, maybe this just reflects the fact that happiness is what we call the state of when we got what we wanted. We're back to philosophy again. Maybe we should never have left it behind. If the result doesn't sound plausible, well, be prepared not to believe everything you read, even if it's brought to you by scientists. They're people too, they have ambitions, they have grants to find, they have budgets to run. Ask yourself what the evidence is. Ask yourself why, if this is such a big deal, Plato and Shakespeare didn't already write about it. What you can do practically, you can actually go and read the research. It's usually not hard to find the paper. Have a look at it. Did they play games in a lab or did they actually test real people? Even better, contact the author of the study. Send them an email. It's very easy to find their email address. Academics are always amazed when anyone takes an interest in their work. It's been estimated that each paper is read about seven times by seven people only. And one of them is your mother. So 
I want to conclude by going back to the question of the non-stick frying pan. Uh, at the end of that article, the author quotes, gives this quote from former president of the American Psychological Association, George Miller. Uh, I believe the real impact of psychology will be felt not through the technological products it places in the hands of powerful men, people, but through its effects on the public at large through a new and different public conception of what is humanly possible and humanly desirable. That was said in 1969, nearly 50 years ago. Uh, we haven't really been making much progress in that direction ever since. So maybe we need to rethink what we want from psychology. We could ask for fewer studies. We could ask for psychologists to spend more time in real settings with people from more backgrounds and cultures instead of what they currently do, which is really party tricks in the laboratory. And this is mostly funded. Almost all psychological research is funded by taxpayers' money. So we're entitled to ask for that to be done better. Thank you.